There were two disagreements between Hiss and Chambers. One was whether Hiss had been a secret communist and spy in the 1930s, and the other was whether the, the two men and their wives had had a close friendship lasting for several years, well into 1938, as the Chambers has said, or only a brief, unpleasant business relationship that was over by mid-35, as the Hiss has said. If you could prove who was lying about the relationship, you might be able to suggest, or that, that might indicate, who was lying about the spying. The prosecution presented testimony and evidence about several business transactions that apparently occurred between these two people and their, their wives uh, that supported Chambers' story, and the Hisses had contrary interpretations of these events. It was evidence about several transactions. The first was that Ford, the 1929 Model A Ford with the hand-operated windshield wipers and the sassy little trunk in the back. Uh, I'm not going to go into that again, but just to, to summarize very quickly, Hiss, as shown at the HUAC hearings, gave away his old Ford in a strange transaction at the end of which it was owned by a communist, and Chambers knew about this transaction, although it occurred a year after he said he'd kicked Chambers out of his life. The next transaction was what I'll call the $400 loan. And this is something that Chambers appears to have, been, have remembered only after he saw Hiss's bank records. And Chambers said, oh, now I remember. It's all coming back to me. He said, when I was secretly planning to escape from the communist underground and start a new life, I needed a new car. And Alger Hiss loaned me $400 for that purpose in late 1937. By the way, that's about half the price of a new car in those days. It's not a trivial sum of money. Uh, now, evidence showed that the Hisses had a joint savings account at Riggs Bank in Washington, that on November 19, 1937, Mrs. Hiss withdrew $400 from that savings account, practically emptying it, leaving almost nothing in the account. She took the $400 in cash, not in the form of a check. All this was shown by the records of the Riggs Bank. Four days later, according to the records of the Schmidt Motor Car Company in Randallstown, Maryland, Mrs. Chambers bought a new Ford for $800, a 325 trade-in value on their old car, and 475 in cash. Now, Chambers said that $400 of the 475 in cash was the $400 he'd gotten from the Hisses that Mrs. Hiss had withdrawn from the savings account a couple of days earlier. The Hisses at both trials said, we did withdraw 400 bucks from our savings account on that date. That's what the bank records show. But it had nothing to do with a loan to the Chamberses. And in fact, we, did, we never saw the Chamberses in 37. Um, they said we withdrew the money, $400, for a totally different reason. Alger had just gotten a promotion at the State Department. We were going to move into a larger house and start doing some semi-formal entertaining. We withdrew the $400 to buy new furniture, stemware, and other household items that an up-and-coming diplomat needs. We also wanted to buy some new things for our stepson, Timmy Hobson, and a fancy dress for Mrs. Hiss to wear at White House receptions. Well, it sounds plausible, but problems developed again. Uh, $400, as I said, is a, a large sum of money in 1937, about half the price of a new car, which would be, what, $8,000 today. If you were buying major items of furniture today, would you b take $8,000 out of a savings account wh or wherever else you're keeping your life savings, carry it around in cash in your wallet or purse? The Hisses had checking accounts. They, they had a checking account at Riggs, and they had, so they could have paid for new stuff with checks, and they also had the 1930s equivalent of credit cards. They had charge accounts at many leading Washington department stores, and they had a habit of paying for major purposes, purchases by check or by charging it. When they were asked, why did you withdraw so much money and carry it around in cash? Why not pay by check or charge it? They said the stores where we bought these things were specialty shops that didn't have charge accounts and didn't take checks and only took cash on the barrel. Another problem with the Hiss's story was that on the day Mrs. Hiss withdrew the $400, they had not yet signed the lease on the new house they moved into about six weeks later. Would you buy lots of new furniture for a house that you weren't yet sure you could move into? Hiss said the agent had given him a verbal commitment for the house the day before Mrs. Hiss withdrew the $400, 
But this agent, as far as I know, has never been found. He certainly didn't testify. And in fact, although the $400 was withdrawn on November 19, 1937, the Volta Place house, this big new house they were going to move into, was still being advertised for rent in the Washington newspapers on December 5th and was shown to potential renters that day. So the Hiss's innocent explanation for draining their savings account had some problems. The third transaction I'll call the Oriental Rug. You may remember that Hiss said the last time I ever saw Crosley was there was a knock on the door and there's this deadbeat subtenant turning up like a bad penny and he gave me a rug. Uh, Chambers said, ah yes, now I remember about the rug and told the following story. By the way, Hiss said that he got the rug in the middle of 36. Chambers said, in late 1936, my boss in the underground, Colonel Boykov, gave me $1,000 in cash, very large sum of money in those days, and told me to pass it on to my best sources, a kind of cash bonus for traders. And I said to him, this is a, with all due respect, this is a terrible idea. These people are doing what they're doing for love, out of idealism, not for money. They would be positively insulted at being paid. And Boykov said, well, look, the money's in the budget and we have to spend it, I guess. Bureaucracies are the same everywhere. And then Boykov had a brainstorm and said, why don't you buy them some presents? Something that looked like they came from the Soviet Union. Uh, and give them to them and say, like some oriental rugs or something like that, and say this is a gift from the grateful workers in rug factory number six in Bukhara or something like that. Now, strong support for this story is the fact that about this time, Chambers suddenly has $1,000. And uh, again, this is the, the price of a medium-sized car, the down payment on a nice house in 1937. There's only one place in Chambers' life that he could have gotten that much money at that time, and that's the communist movement. Well, Chambers thought, aha, rugs that look like they came from, that's a good idea, it looked like they came from the Soviet Union. How do I get four rugs that look like they came from the Soviet Union? Got to think, got to think, and he went, I know who can do that for me. My old friend Meyer Shapiro, my ex-Columbia classmate, European travel buddy in 1922, now a professor at Columbia, on already on his way to becoming the world's greatest art historian. Meyer will know how to do that. And he wrote away to Dr. Shapiro and said, Meyer, if I sent you $900, apparently Chambers kept 100 for himself, if I gave you $900, could you get me four area rugs that look like they came from the Soviet Union? Uh, Chambers didn't tell Shapiro this had anything to do with spying for the Soviet Union. Shapiro said, sure, he corresponded with rug people. And in late 1936, Meyer Shapiro paid just under $900 for four area rugs. And Shapiro took the witness stand and testified about all this. And he apparently was a pack rat, and he kept all the checks and the correspondence. The four rugs, it was shown by lots of paper, arrived in New York City on December 29, 1936. And they reached Washington in the early days of January 1937. Now, Chambers said the rugs were picked up from Union Station by one of his sources in the Treasury Department, a man named George Silverman. He said Silverman was supposed to keep one for himself and give one each to Harry Dexter White, that was the, guy in, the other guy in Treasury, and to Julian Wadley. And then Chambers said one night in January 1937, Silverman drove the fourth rug to a parking lot of a restaurant that was shaped like a boat on the Baltimore Pike near College Park, Maryland. Silverman went to the parking lot, left his trunk a little bit open. In another car in the same lot, said Chambers, were I and Alger Hiss. And I moved the rug from Silverman's trunk to Alger's so that those two never saw each other. And then we all went our separate ways. And Chambers said, that's how Alger Hiss got the rug from me in early 1937, and we were still friends then. Now, the testimonies of Dr. Shapiro and various rug dealers and rug brokers who also testified, and their regularly kept business records showing the rug's arrival in Washington in 1937, show, if you believe Chambers' story, that the Hiss Chambers relationship lasted into 1937 about 18 months after Hiss said it ended. 
Now, Hiss at the trials had a very good answer to all this. He said, I have no doubt that everything Dr. Shapiro said is true and all this paper is true. Chambers bought four rugs through Dr. Shapiro in late 1936, and they came to Washington in early 37. The rug I got from Chambers was about six months earlier. I guess Chambers imported rugs from time to time, and um, that's my story. And it's completely consistent with what, with, with what everybody but Chambers has said. Well, uh, maybe you leave that. Uh, one weakness that some people have pointed out is that if you, you may recall his, to say, his saying to HUAC when he, when he brought up the story about the rug, he said, I've still got the damn thing. And indeed he did. And some people have said, uh, if his had the rug, and it's not one of the rugs that Dr. Shapiro got for Chambers, when Shapiro was on the stand, Hiss would have brought it into court and unrolled it and said, Dr. Shapiro, world's greatest art historian, you must remember the kind of rugs you got for Mr. Chambers. Is this one of those rugs? And Shapiro would have said, oh my God, no, this is white and the rugs I got were blue or something like that. And Hiss didn't do that. On the other hand, it's true that Hiss offered to bring the rug into court and the prosecution said, you don't need to do that. A bigger problem to me is that there's only one person in the whole wide world who ever said that he got a rug from Chambers in the middle of 1936, and that's Alger Hiss. Um, the final weakness is that if you, if you believe Hiss, then, Ch then Chambers knew how to import rugs. And if he knew that, why would he get Dr. Shapiro to do it for him in late 1937? Pardon me, late 36. Well, so we've got the car with the sassy trunk and the $400 loan, supposedly, in the rug. Make of these transactions what you want. There's evidence supporting his chamber story, and his has a good explanation or an expl a plausible explanation for each one. In my opinion, if there'd been only one of these alleged by Chambers and only one Rococo excuse by his, you might be willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. But can you believe his explanations for all of these, which collectively show a close family relationship lasting into 1937? In addition, there was a lot of testimony we just don't have time to go into, but I want to summarize so you know it's there. Both chambers has described the insides and outsides of the Hiss's various houses, and then other witnesses testified that they had been right or wrong about the, out the, the color of the room was or the wallpaper and that sort of thing. Um, I have not made a minute analysis of who got how many things right and wrong. It seems to me that chambers got much of it right, but they also got much of it wrong saying that a certain feature of a house was a certain way in the 1930s, and it was proved that that was not the way it was in the 30s, it was the way it was in the 1940s. So, Most elaborately, Chambers alleged a three-day car trip by him and the Hisses to Peterborough, New Hampshire, in the second week of August 1937. He said the three of them, it not including Mrs. Chambers, uh, drove up to Peterborough. They stayed at a guest house in Peterborough named Bleak House after the Charles Dickens novel, and they attended a summer stock production of the classic English comedy She Stoops to Conquer. Um, the Hisses absolutely denied that 90% uh, of the socializing alleged by the Chambers ever happened. They denied, for example, that the Chamberses had ever set foot in their house on 30th Street, where they lived starting in the middle of 1936, or their house in Volta Place, where they moved to at the end of 1937. They completely denied the trip to Peterborough. They said that on the dates of the alleged Peterborough trip, they were at a summer rental in Chestertown, Maryland, and that Alger daily visited his stepson at a nearby summer camp where the boy was recovering from having broken a leg. Concerning the alleged Peterborough trip, no fewer than 14 witnesses testified as, I saw Mr. Hiss at the camp, I so-and-so, Mr. Chambers' description of the driveway of the place in Peterborough was correct. No fewer than 14 witnesses testified to whether some aspect of one guy's story was true. Uh, suffice it to say, neither side scored a knockout blow. And I think that all these issues, uh, despite their colorful, memorable aspects, paled into insignificance before the handwritten and typewritten documents. And that was the prosecution's case at the first trial. When the prosecution rested, Lloyd Paul Stryker moved Judge Kaufman to dismiss the case. And ruling in his chambers, Judge Kaufman said that he was very close to dismissing the case. 
because of Chambers' long line of perjuries and the, weak, the weakness of the evidence corroborating him. But those words may have been just a, a consolation prize for Mr. Stryker because Judge Kaufman denied his motion to dismiss and he required the defense to put on its case.